She used to be an astrophysiologist, so she used to look at our stars, and today she is our star, because she is our keynote, spe uh, our keynote speaker, works as an analyst at Gardner. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Samantha Searle. <laughs> Samantha, Thank you. welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. We live in an era of digital disruption. We've already seen the first wave of digital disruption hit us all. That powerful combination of cloud, mobile, social, big data, and analytics. And some organizations are still recovering from its effects. We can all think of big brands that have gone bust because they didn't see digital coming, and they misunderstood just how much it was going to impact their business. Ladies and gentlemen, the second wave of digital disruption is already upon us. And it's in the five trends that I'm going to present to you this morning. These five trends will shape the digital world of the future. We start with artificial intelligence. Finally, after decades of being rooted in theory and science labs, we're seeing real practical applications of AI. This is thanks to advance in techniques like machine learning, deep neural networks, and natural language processing that are finally giving us meaningful results from AI. But AI doesn't act alone. It also influences other trends and makes them grow and become even more impactful. We've all seen the Internet of Things explode onto the scene. Now, with applying techniques like machine learning to the data generated from this, we're able to design much more intelligent things, devices, and sensors that make Internet of Things even more powerful. With advances in natural language processing, we're also seeing virtual assistants come onto the scene. How many of you use Cortana or Siri on your phones? Yeah. That's a few of you. So if you've used them, you've got a pretty good idea of where their limitations lie. So you'll notice I'm not calling them intelligent assistants yet, but that will come. So what Gartner envisages is that these virtual assistants will grow into conversational platforms. They'll get better at generating dialogue with us rather than just performing one-off requests and they will become central to how we interact with each other and digital business. So together, these three tens form the artificial intelligence theme of our future digital world. We then have a bit of a newer trend, the digital twin. Anyone heard of digital twin? A few of you over there, excellent. That's pretty much what I would expect, because this is a very new trend. A digital twin is a dynamic software model that's actually linked to a physical object, or an asset, or a system, in such a way that it actually takes data in real time from that system, so you can monitor how that system is performing, and you can seek to improve it, or perhaps repair it if there's a problem. So despite being a very new trend, it has a huge amount of potential. Last but certainly not least is blockchain. Who's heard of blockchain? Yeah, that's most of you. Let's be honest. If you haven't heard of blockchain, you've probably been living on a different planet from the rest of us. There's been a lot of hype and excitement around blockchain, particularly with its connection with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. But like any other hyped up trend, we've yet to see if blockchain will live up to the reality. So these are two trends that, again, link into the digital theme of our digital world. At Gartner, we see digital business as optimizing and leveraging interactions between people, systems, and things. And in the context of a digital world, you're enabling these synergies between the digital world represented by things like digital twin and blockchain, and the physical world. So let's start by talking about AI. Now, the mere mention of artificial intelligence 
conjures up this image of this all-powerful, all-knowing robot that has vast superior intelligence to us and is going to take over the entire world, much to the detriment of humankind. You'll be pleased to know that is still far from reality. But what we are seeing now is people are designing AI systems for a particular purpose. Where they are better than us mere humans is they're much better at handling complexity than we are. The key game changer here is machine learning. So compared with traditional programming, where we code the rules, we pretty much tell these systems how we expect them to behave and act. But with machine learning, we're feeding these systems data so they can figure out what those rules are themselves. As some of you may know, there are two main types. So with supervised learning, you feed the systems a model, but you do let it know what those rules are. So then it just has to figure out how to apply those rules to know how to act and behave in a given environment. With unsupervised learning, you don't do that. You don't tell it what the rules are. It has to figure it out themselves. So you feed it lots and lots of data. It determines what those patterns and rules are, and then tests them out, applies them to see how the system should behave and act in that environment. And that's where the the real advantage lies, and why we see these systems appearing to behave autonomously. It's important to realize this isn't the same as intelligence. They're not thinking like us yet, and a point at which they will be able to do that is a subject of much debate. They're still dependent on us feeding them the information and refining the, the outputs, the results we get. So there's a lot of work involved in training these systems to get the results. So it's promising, but the rate at which these systems are able to learn and the amount of training they need will determine how long it is before they become more truly intelligent. Now, one aspect of machine learning I'd like to call out is deep learning. We're seeing massive advances in image recognition. So if, for example, you gave an AI system lots of pictures of cats and dogs, because everybody loves cats and dogs, right? Not only could that system tell you whether the image was a cat or dog, it could actually tell you the right breed of cat and dog as well. So we're seeing this kind of technology applied a lot to security cameras in cities like London and Boston so you can track known criminals or even potential terrorists. However, my favorite example of this image recognition software is in Japan, where their Western Railway look to use this software in cameras in their station. Now, Japan's pretty safe. They weren't looking for criminals. They were looking for drunk people, because drunk people are a real hazard in a train station, particularly if they might fall on the tracks. So this software can detect if someone's just that little bit wobbly on their feet, or perhaps they've passed out on the platform. In that case, the software can flag that this is probably a drunk person and send a signal so a human can go and help them get home safely. We're then also seeing machine learning being applied to intelligent things. So let me share a few examples with you. Microsoft is working with a European manufacturer on a smart fridge. The fridge is smart because it can take an inventory of what's inside it. So if you're like me, and you tend to make a very detailed shopping list on paper, and I know I should do it on my smartphone, and then you leave that piece of paper at home when you go to do the shopping, this kind of technology is really going to help. Because you can immediately see how a smart fridge could talk to a conversational platform, something like Amazon Echoes Alexa or the Google Now. You could make your shopping list on there. The conversational platform would talk to your fridge, check what's in it, check what items you usually have stocked in your fridge might be missing, and they could compile a shopping list. You can also add to that shopping list. Then all you need to do when you're ready to order your shopping is approve the list, talk to, say, Alexa, agree a delivery shot, and your shopping will be brought to your house. Now we can all see why Amazon was so keen to buy Whole Foods, because they're pretty much set up to deliver this. 
We're also seeing Google DeepMind work with a top London hospital to find better ways of detecting cancers in the head and neck using machine learning and those image recognition technologies. We're seeing IoT platforms also use external weather data to understand how to automatically adjust the temperature inside a building, given how hot or cold it is outside. Then let's talk about those conversational systems. We've gone through a transition where we've been working mainly with desktop PCs and laptops in the past to more and more devices, from our smartphones and tablets to smart watches and other wearables. We're now in a world where we can work anywhere, anytime, on any device. And it's this conversational platform, that evolution of the virtual assistants, that will become our key point of contact for transitioning seamlessly across these devices. So whereas today we tend to ask them to do something, we could ask them to say, do a dinner reservation for us, or tell us what the time or the weather is, they'll be knowing so much about us from all the interactions we have with these conversational systems, the data they have on where we are every day, purchasing habits as well, if you think about how Amazon Alexa works, that they will be able to reactively suggest tasks to us. So they may see we're working abroad and we haven't got a dinner reservation. They may know we like Chinese food, so they'll actually look at TripAdvisor, suggest one of the top Chinese restaurants that they and offer to book us a reservation. So this marks a key shift from us having to initiate the interactions with them to them practically reaching out to us to help. Seems convenient, doesn't it? But they will know everything about us. These conversational platforms will be like having our own personal stalker. But we've invited them right in to our own homes to sell us products and services. So it's well worth thinking about. We have all this convenience of automating daily tasks, but at the expense of our data and privacy. The other key shift to recognize is these conversational platforms will have a radical impact on how we design user experience. Because we'll have to account for all these different modes of interaction. So it won't just be touch or type, it'll now be voice commands. If you think about virtual reality, it'll also be gestures. And given the advances in image recognition, it'll also be about facial recognition. They'll even be able to detect our emotions. Personally, I'm really looking forward to that, because next time in the future, when I ask Alexa a question and she gets it wrong, at least she'll be able to see the look of annoyance on my face and know she needs to have another go. Then we get on to the digital twin, which is that dynamic software model that gives us a means of monitoring a real-world object. It might be an asset, like an airplane engine, or an entire system. And because this software model is able to take in real-time data from that system, you can look at how it's currently performing, what its state is, and you can try and improve that state, perhaps make it more efficient or add value. So already seeing with Digital Twin, there are key use cases for things like predictive or even preventative maintenance, in things like a smart factory. Now, it was actually NASA that pioneered the Digital Twin concept. If you think about what NASA does, this makes sense. They're putting spacecraft into very extreme conditions. They're currently working with Siemens on the Dream Chaser, which will be the next craft to go to the International Space Station. That craft has to be capable of withstanding temperatures of up to 1,600 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot. So you can see how useful it is to have a digital twin that would simulate those conditions so you can check you've got the right material and the right form of aircraft to withstand those kind of extreme temperatures and pressures. General Electric also uses a digital twin for things like wind farms. So you can have a digital twin of your wind turbine to check how it's performing, diagnose any problems, and then you can actually build a digital entity of the entire wind farm. So given that the speed and direction of the wind will change, 
you can use a digital twin to manipulate the entire wind farm and optimize its energy production. Last but certainly not least, we come to blockchain. Now, blockchain has got to be the most hyped up term of 2016, and that's very much continued in 2017. Like all hyped up terms, there's a lot of confusion about what it means. So at Gartner, we tried to bring some clarity to that confusion. Blockchain is a type of distributed ledger, which means that you're recording transactions over a peer-to-peer -peer network in a means that they are cryptographically signed and immutable. They cannot be changed. You can then date and timestamp those records, and whoever has access to that network can go in and access them and read them. Now, blockchain is a type of distributed ledger where those transactions are exchanges of value. In the case of Bitcoin, it's financial value that's being exchanged. So you basically have a sequence of blocks. Each block is connected to the previous block. And again, it's done in a way where each record is cryptographically signed and immutable. The reason everyone's getting so excited about blockchain is this provides a way of having a trusted mechanism in an environment where you're dealing with anonymous entities. You don't know who those people are, you don't know if you can trust them, but here you do have a trusted mechanism. And it's also something that's decentralized. So this is why people perceive it as a threat to financial institutions and governments. But it could also be seen as an opportunity. We're seeing a lot of emerging use cases for blockchain outside the financial industry. Things like a smart contract, where instead of having those transactions, you've got a bit of computer code that can actually execute terms of a contract. We're seeing a lot of startups in this area, but to date, Bitcoin remains the only proven implementation of blockchain at scale. But it's quite possible that will change in the foreseeable future. To just give you a quick example of how else blockchain can be applied, Honduras is a country that's looking into this because blockchain has a, a, can potentially solve a problem. Honduras had their land title registry system hacked. The bureaucrats got in and they assigned themselves some very nice pieces of land just by the beach where they could build themselves a very nice beach house. Not really how you want your bureaucrats behaving, is it? What they hope to do is to use blockchain to build a much more secure land title registry system that cannot be hacked and whose records cannot be changed. Now, Honduras is still in the progress of this project, but actually the Republic of Georgia has already implemented this kind of system using blockchain. So it's quite an interesting application of the technology. So that gives you a quick whistle-stop tour of these top five trends. We call them strategic technology trends because these are the trends you simply cannot afford to ignore. They will have a huge impact on us, both as consumers and as employees and as citizens, as well as impacting the organizations we work for. My advice to each and every one of you is make sure that your organization isn't one of those that disappears due to digital disruption. Understand these trends. Plan for how they're going to impact your business. Mitigate the risks they pose, or seizing the advantages that these technology trends offer. That way, your organization will not only survive digital disruption, but actively thrive on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>